Hello and welcome to Emerald Integrations installation video. Today we're going to be going over our OEM integrated wireless Apple CarPlay and Android Auto system. This kit will allow you to connect your Apple or Android device to the original factory screen either wirelessly through Bluetooth or via the provided USB cable. Once connected, you'll be able to activate and select your CarPlay or Android application, navigate song selection, control the volume, and use voice recognition apps such as Hey Siri or OK Google, all with the original OEM controls of your vehicle. This system is compatible with any BMW that is equipped with the original factory BMW NBT infotainment system. The NBT system can typically be found in BMWs that were manufactured between 2012 and 2017. However, this can vary, so it is important that you confirm that your BMW is equipped with the NBT command system before moving any further. The simplest way to identify your BMW's command system is to take a look at the main menu. On the left-hand side, the background should be black, on the right, your selections should not only be outlined, but also highlighted in orange. And below the screen, you should see eight preset buttons. The older CIC models will typically only have six. Our integration system is a simple to install plug and play kit that does not require any programming or any wire cutting, splicing or soldering. Before we start, let's go over the contents of your OEM integrated wireless Apple CarPlay and Android Auto system. Your package should include the main Emerald Integrations module, also referred to as an interface module, one quad lock harness, one LVDS cable, which may be pink or blue, one USB video harness, and one antenna. These five components are all you need. If you opted for a camera add-on, those components will come in a separate box. And now, let's get started. The first thing we need to do is gain access to the connections behind the factory head unit. In this installation video, we'll be installing our system onto a 2015 BMW 528i. For this vehicle, we have to remove the panel segment above the glove compartment. Start by opening the glove compartment. To remove the panel, start on the far right side by popping off the clips. There's going to be seven clips behind this panel. Five of them on the right side of the vent, and the last two are over near the driver's side. Starting in the right corner, apply pressure from below, carefully pulling towards you until it pops out of the clip. Be careful not to only pull from the far end. Instead, slowly work your way over as you pop the panel out from each clip. Once you've detached the panel from each clip, carefully pull the panel towards you. The panel will still be attached by three to four connectors near the air vents, which you'll need to disconnect before safely placing the panel off to the side. Next, we're gonna remove the faceplate. To do so, first you'll need to remove two screws from the top of the head unit, one on the right and one on the left. Then firmly grab the faceplate from the top and carefully apply pressure, pulling towards you until it detaches from the clips behind it. There are two clips on the top and two at the bottom. You should hear a pop sound as each clip detaches from the faceplate. Once you have your faceplate pulled away from the head unit, you have two connectors remaining, one blue and one black. These connectors are held in place by a locking bar. To disconnect them, you're going to depress the locking feature on the back side of the connector. Then, pull the guard lever all the way back, firmly applying pressure until your connector pops out of place. You can follow the same process for the second connector to disconnect that as well. Once you have them both disconnected, move the faceplate off to the side in a safe location. With all the trim out of the way, you almost have access to the connections on the back of the head unit. Now, remove the screws out of each corner of the head unit. Once you have all four screws removed, you can simply slide the head unit out of its compartment to reach all of the wiring in the back. The top of the head unit should have the manufacturer's sticker. If you look closely, you should see that the unit is labeled as an NBT radio. If it says CCC, CIC, or EVO, stop what you're doing and call our tech support line at 844-333-3903 so that we can set up an exchange for the compatible model. Next step in the process is removing the screen. Start by removing two screws at the bottom of the screen. Once you have those removed, grab the plastic frame around the edge of the screen, pull the bottom of the screen towards you at a slightly upward angle to ensure the hooks at the top of the screen unlatch so you do not damage the dash. On the back of the display, you will see the LVDS cable that we'll need to use for this installation. To correctly connect our interface, you'll need to disconnect the factory LVDS cable from the back of the monitor 
and plug that into our video interface module. To disconnect the LVDS cable, press down on the locking tab and pull the cable out of the port. If you have trouble removing it, first ensure the cable is still not locked into place by any tabs. Then you may want to use a forked panel removal tool for better leverage. Once you remove the factory LVDS cable, take a look at the pins. You should see a circular four pin connector with two pins at the top. If you don't see the additional two pins at the top of the connector, there's a good chance you have the older CIC radio and you should stop what you're doing and contact our tech support for further assistance. Once confirmed that you have the NVT LVDS cable, plug that into the LVDS in port on the video interface module. Then locate the provided LVDS cable. You'll notice one side will be straight, the other will have a 90 degree L shape. The straight side should be connected to LVDS out on the interface module, then connect the angled side back into the monitor where you originally disconnected the factory LVDS cable. This configuration will help with routing. Next we'll go over the quad lock configuration, starting with swapping the fiber optics cable. On the back of the head unit, you'll see the factory quad lock connector. To disconnect the harness, press down on the two buttons on each side of the locking bar. Once those are released, you'll be able to pull up the locking bar and release the quad lock. With the quad lock removed, locate the two green wires going into the back of the harness. These will be your fiber optic cables. You'll need to de-pin the fiber optic cable along with its plastic casing from the OEM harness and connect that into the same port of the provided quad lock connector. To de-pin the fiber optic cable, use a 45 or 90 degree angle pick and place it in between the casing of the fiber optic and the locking tab inside the actual port. You'll need to press upward to release the tab and simply pull out the fiber optic cable. Once removed, locate the provided quad lock connector. On the back of the matching end, you'll see a corresponding slot for a fiber optic cable. Connect the fiber optic cable here before continuing with your quad lock configuration. With the fiber optic cable transferred to the provided quad lock, you can now plug in the factory quad lock into the receiving end of our provided quad lock and then connect the provided quad lock back into the head unit in the same location that the OEM harness previously occupied. When connecting the quad locks, make sure that they are fully seated into the ports and locked into place using the locking bar. This will ensure a secure connection and avoid any installation related issues going forward. Once the quad locks have been connected, we need to provide power to the interface module. Before doing so, check the guide on the back of the interface to confirm that the dip switches are configured correctly based on the screen size measured diagonally. Then, connect the white connector of the power harness into the port labeled CAN power. Make sure that this harness is fully seated and snapped into position. At this point, you should be able to turn on and operate the CarPlay system. However, there are a few more steps you should take before doing so. Coming from the quad lock connector, you'll notice a 3.5mm auxiliary plug. This plug will need to connect to the factory aux input that can be found in the armrest compartment. You can run that wire through the paneling to hide the cable from view. Once connected, you'll need to go into the vehicle settings and change the sound source. To do so, click the multimedia button on the iDrive controller, then select external device and set the audio to auxiliary or aux front in order to transmit the sound to the vehicle speakers wirelessly. Also, coming off the quad lock harness is a black audio ground wire which you can identify by its label. Connect this cable to a solid ground source to eliminate any static or interference. You will also find a USB video harness included in the system. On this harness, you will see multiple wires including one female USB port, two female RCA ports, and four loose leads, all of which should be labeled with their respective functions. For CarPlay and Android Auto installation, only the USB port will be needed. This cable should be accessible to the driver after the installation is complete to provide the option of wired connection and for possible future updates via USB drive. The RCA ports and loose lead wires on the USB video harness are only used if you're upgrading your vehicle with a rear and or front camera add-on. If that's the case in your installation, you would simply connect the camera's RCA into the corresponding RCA input, power it with the red or yellow power outputs, and ground the black lead. 
If you're adding a backup camera to a vehicle with a manual transmission, you will need to trigger the backup camera by adding a reverse signal to the purple wire labeled reverse detect. Anytime you add on a camera, you will need to properly configure the settings. Just go to the settings option on the main menu of our interface, then enter the parking submenu and change the rear camera type from original to aftermarket. If your vehicle has a manual transmission, you will also need to turn on the option labeled Activate R-Cam Through Reversing Lights. For a wireless connection, you'll need to connect the provided Wi-Fi Bluetooth antenna. The plug end connects to the blue port marked ANT on the provided module. Then, peel away the orange plastic film on the back side and stick the antenna to a plastic surface inside the dash. Be sure not to stick it to anything metal in order to avoid any static or interference. At this point, your wiring should be arranged as follows. The OEM LVDS cable is connected from the head unit to the LVDS in port of the interface module. The provided LVDS cable is connected from the LVDS out port back into the factory screen. The provided quad lock harness has replaced the OEM quad lock harness in the head unit, and the OEM quad lock has been connected to the other end of the one provided. We've connected the aux cable to the vehicle's aux port and grounded the audio ground lead. The USB cable is connected to the interface and accessible by the driver, and the antenna has been secured on a plastic surface to allow a wireless connection. If you have any questions or concerns regarding the installation, please don't hesitate to contact our tech support team during our normal business hours. We're available from Monday through Friday from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. Pacific Standard Time via phone, live chat, or email. Congratulations and enjoy.